Okay, told you guys, go ahead and find these values, run these numbers through your calculator, see what you get. You guys got that? If you don't, pause it. I'm about to reveal it. And it, as you guys are probably painfully learning, just seeing a solution doesn't do you any good. You actually got to work through it on your own. You got a solution? Okay, let's see how you did. All right, so we find H2 just in the tables. Saturated liquid at the given pressure at 800 kilopascals. Um, H1 you had to interpolate. Okay, you don't have a row for 35 at 800 kilopascals. You know it's superheated vapor, but you don't have a row for 35. You do have a row for 40, and you've got the saturated row. Well, at 800 it's boiling at 31.31. So you've got, you're interpolating between the row for 40 and the row for 31.31. You're interpolating to 35. So that sets H1. H1 ends up I got 271.21. Okay. So my mass flow rate times delta H gives me Q dot H. Now I've got a number. Now, is that my answer? What the heck are we looking for? <laughs> That's, guys, um, it, it, I always say it's, it's not a good problem unless you have to ask yourself at least more than once, what the hell are we looking for? Um, and we found QH. Now, how does that help us? Well, we go back and we say, all right, what are we looking for? Well, we're looking for Q dot L, and we're looking for COP HP. Now, I do know Q dot H now. I do know the power input, so I could go ahead and find my coefficient of performance for the heat pump now. So I can go ahead and do that. Again, that's going to be my Q dot H here. Uh, let me look. I'm going to have a pop here. I want to make sure I don't have a glare on that. Okay. So I'm going to take... COP is going to be QH over my power input. I've got QH now. Here is 3.163 divided by my power input of 1.2. Those are both kilowatts. So that's okay. I've got a COP of 2.64. 2.64 is my COP. That's one answer. Okay. And my second answer, they wanted to know Q dot L. Now, there's various ways you can find that. Um, we've already written this expression here. We know the work in, we know, or the power input. We know Q dot L. Sorry, my cord's getting in the way. My phone is about to die. Um, we already know QL. I'm sorry, we know QH. We know the power input. We're looking for QL. That works. You could also solve this expression. Now, I know COP. I could solve for QL. Take your pick. Either way, it works. I'm going to say that QL... We'll solve this guy is equal to Q dot H minus the power input. 3.163, this guy, minus the 1.2. is 1.963 kilowatts. I, I would, I don't even, probably don't even need that third significant digit, honestly. Two significant, I'm sorry, three significant digits would be just fine. We don't need the fourth one, I should say. Anyway, if you have questions, let me know. Um, that's kind of a nice, simple example problem, chapter six type example problem to look through. Nice heat pump example. Okay? Have questions, send me an email, leave me a comment down below. If you don't mind it being public domain, if you want to do it privately, just send me an email. Either way, it works. Um, but I guarantee if you've got a question, there's probably other people watching this video that have the same question. Steve, how the heck did you do this? What is this? Well, it's just interpolation. Right? And refer, refer back to that. Anyway. Okay. Let's move. Normally I would ask for questions and I'd wait until I wait and give you a really uncomfortable pause and, and then we'd move on. Okay. But anyway, here we are. Right, so we got our COP. I'm going to make sure there's no glare. I'm going to pop here. I'm going to turn my screen back on. Okay. All right, so we got those answers right, at least according to this particular solutions manual I pulled this from. Awesome. Okay, now let's talk about perpetual motion machines. So historically, we've known for a long period of time that you cannot build a device that just on its own will operate perpetually. Now, even before we really understood thermodynamics, we didn't understand why this was the case. We just understood you couldn't. What we know today is we can't do this because of 
the first and or the second law. A perpetual motion machine is any device that violates either the first or second law of thermodynamics. In theory, if we could violate either the first or the second law of thermodynamics, you could have a machine that could operate perpetually with no outside influence as long as you could run it. Okay? Um, now, we do have a lot of devices that we operate for long periods of time, what might appear to be perpetually, but that's only because we're providing an exterior amount of energy. Now, here's one that violates one of the two laws of thermo. Think about this. What is your system? Well, it's, it's the shaded area. Okay, what crosses the system boundary? Well, I've got minus work out, and I've got minus heat out. And if it's a cyclic system, that has to be equal to zero. If it's a steady flow system, that's got to be equal to zero. If it's, you know, it's operating steadily. So if I've got minus work out, minus Q out equals zero, write that out. If, if, you, if you don't see it in your head why that's wrong, write that out. Write out minus W minus Q equals zero. And that doesn't work, right? I mean, the idea that you could take some of the electricity off this generator and use that to, to run your boiler, not have, a, not have to pay for fuel, that'd be cool. Man, that'd be awesome. But you can't. That violates the first law. That's saying you're generating energy in here. Okay. Um, now, I mean, we could run this. We could do this, and we could run this for a very brief period of time. But eventually, it would stop operating. You can't run this perpetually. This is a perpetual motion machine. Okay. Now, um, and I can't get my PowerPoint to work right now. This is a... If you download this, if you, if you have PowerPoint, if you download this presentation, this is actually a cool GIF file where this thing actually spins. Um, anyway, once we establish the laws of thermodynamics, that's one of the first things that a, a patent granting body is going to do is they're going to look at the science behind it and they're going to say, hey, does this violate the laws of physics, thermodynamics, physics, any of the like? Does this generate um, energy, destroy energy? Does it, gen does it destroy entropy? So, for an, for an object to be reversible, <clears throat> basically that means it could operate perpetually. And it's kind of the, the theoretical limit. It's, it's the holy grail, if you will. It's, um, if we could operate something, if we could do something that is reversible, that means I could get it back to its initial state and not leave a trace on the surroundings. So I can get both the system and the surroundings back to their original state. And so just about everything we observe does not do this. And just about everything we uh, you're going to encounter is irreversible. Okay. Um, wh so what causes that? Okay. What what causes things to be irreversible? Well, friction is one of our favorite culprits. We always like to say friction is, is an irreversibility. And, and, you know, it, yeah, the friction does rob us of energy, so to speak, but it also makes motion possible. So there's actually some advantages to having friction, um, but it does basically turn mechanical energy, like work, kinetic, and potential energy, into thermal energies like heat and internal energy. Okay? Uh, electrical resistance is akin to friction for electricity. You've got flowing electrons. They encounter resistance, that generates heat, uh, and again, you're converting kinetic or uh, kinetic energy or work energy, good mechanical energy, you're converting that into thermal energy. Uh, if I mix fluids, so if I take um, pure oxygen and pure nitrogen in separate cylinders and I mix those together, I can separate them, but it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of effort to do that. And I'm gonna, the surroundings are going to be different once I do that work. Okay. Uh, chemical reactions are typically irreversible. Now, we have some that can be really close to reversible, uh, but over the longest period of time, they're, they're all irreversible on some level. Um, this textbook, the Changel and Bowles textbook, gives a good example in the text about uh, chemical reactions, the idea of baking a cake. So if I bake a cake, if I take flour, sugar, eggs, milk, and I mix those up in the right proportions, add some leavening, and I bake that. And I get this delicious cake, assuming I mix it right. Okay. Um, now, the question is, can I turn that cake back? Can I reverse that and turn that cake into eggs, sugar, 
flour, and milk. In theory, I could. I could grind that cake up, and I could feed some cake to some chickens and some cake to some cows. I don't know if they're going to like that. I don't know. I, I used to show cattle. I think my, my cattle would like that. Um, you, you could. You could feed the... You can feed some of the cake to the chickens and some of the cake to the cows and get some milk and some eggs back and you could take some of the cake and sprinkle out in a wheat field and grow more wheat um, and get more flour that way. But to get it all the way back to those raw ingredients, you and the livestock, the chickens and the cows, are all going to be generating heat along the way. You're all, everything's going to be doing things that are irreversible. You cannot get the system and the surroundings back to get that cake back into sugar, flour, eggs, and milk. You could theoretically get the system, the cake, back to its initial state, but not the surroundings also. That's an irreversible process. And all known processes are essentially irreversible. Okay, they have some level of irreversibility. Okay. Now let's see if I can um, See if I can pull my PowerPoint up here and let's look at the <clears throat> see if we can look at lecture sixteen here. Let's see if this will display for me. I apologize. I should have had this already pulled up. Come on. Okay. So here we are. Okay. So where does that lead us? Where do we go from there? Well, let's talk about one of the first known proposed um, reversible cycles. Pierre Sidi Carnot, and he's got about four or five more names than that. Those are the three I remember off the top of my head. Pierre Sidi Carnot uh, proposes a completely reversible cycle, and because it's reversible, that means it's the most efficient cycle that we could be proposed. Um, I'm not a history buff. Uh, if you if you want to go look up this guy, I, I'm sharing a picture here from Wikipedia. I like to share pictures of these people. Um, and, and I always make this terrible joke in class about, uh, look, it, when you're working your homework and you're spending hours and, and you're like, Steve, I really don't like you right now because of this homework. It's not me. I didn't do it. This guy. This guy, right? This is it. Direct your anger towards this guy. Um, he he proposed the Carnot cycle in, in a dissertation. Um, he, much like Kelvin Plank and, and Clausus, was trying to find the best way to get the most work he possibly could out of a, out of an engine, out of a steam engine or a heat engine, some of the like. And they, um, so what did he come up with? Well, he came up with this process. Now I'm going to draw this out with you, okay? I'm going to draw this out with you. But he proposes all these processes are reversible, okay? So let's draw this out, okay? So I, uh, process one, all right, so let's do this. This is, I'll draw this with you. As we talked about, you should be Taking notes as you go along, trick your brain into thinking this is important, because it is important. Um, Carnot cycle. Step one. Isothermal expansion. Do you know what isothermal means? If you don't, um, I could tell you, but what I would suggest to you is if you'll pause it and go look it up, then you own that knowledge and it sticks with you. I could tell you, and I will tell you, but if you want to pause, go look up what does isothermal mean, and then come back, do that. Okay? Iso refers to constant thermal referring to temperature. This is constant temperature expansion. Isothermal expansion. So I'm going to draw a PV diagram. Why would I draw a PV diagram? Any ideas? Well, that's where we're going to pick up the next video. Answer, why would we draw a PV diagram?